welcome to this week's episode of What a Hell of a Way to Die. Uh, it's just me. Francis is out today, and uh, I am in the privileged position to be speaking with someone who actually knows a lot about the military, military recruitment enlistment, and uh, the way it affects people. I am speaking with Sophia Aptekar, the professor at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. I have to refer to my notes to make sure I say it correctly, uh, who has written a book called Green Card Soldier Between Model Immigrant and Security Threat. Uh, Sophia, thank you so much for, for reaching out to us and for making time for this today. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm so excited to be on this podcast. I am a loyal listener and I listened to it while I wrote my book. So That's amazing. I, it's, it's pivoted a bit towards dad content because <laughs> at this point in our lives, you know, Francis is retired and I've been out longer than I was in. And so when there's a specifically military themed thing to talk about, we'll talk about it. But in a way, we kind of made the decision that we were we didn't want to keep rehashing like the experiences we had because Francis was a reservist, so he had a couple of stretches on active duty when he was deployed, and then I was in for seven years, like seven years and two weeks exactly. And so I just uh, yeah, I, I have enjoyed you know we talk about army stuff periodically, um, but mostly just dad stuff. And uh, the fact that you're still listening that's that's amazing. I'm really happy to hear that. <laughs> I'm hooked. What can I say? I want to talk a little bit before we start in great detail that uh, when I first started reading the book, I was like, yeah, this, this, the topic, the general subject matter seems pretty familiar to me. But then what, something that I realized was that my experience and my kind of notions of what it was like for non-citizens in the US military was so dated and kind of confined by the period that I was in, uh, which is I served from 07 to 14. And... I can recall some things going into place like the uh, naturalization during basic training and the push to get as many soldiers as possible to have uh, a secret clearance, uh, which required them to be U.S. citizens, I believe. And then I didn't know what it was like before, and I certainly didn't realize how much more difficult it had become uh, in, since 2016. And so I guess in that regard, it's, it's funny. I, I feel like I can... I can give a couple of anecdotes, but I actually feel like it's more productive to just kind of ask you, as you were researching this, did you feel like this was a surprise? Like this was, the, or did you think that it was going to be kind of like a consistent story throughout that, uh, that the military both wanted people to serve, even if they weren't U.S. citizens, in some cases, especially if they weren't U.S. citizens, but then also made it incredibly difficult for them uh, if they were both in terms of the jobs they could have, but then also if they wanted to naturalize? Yeah, great question. I, you know, I, I came to the project kind of, I was aware that non-citizens had been in the U.S. military from the beginning of the U.S. military and were like a pretty huge chunk of the force um, in some of the conflicts. Um, but I really, I was surprised to find just how, except for, you know, like short periods of times in recent years, getting citizenship through the military, which is, you know, there's supposedly an expedited route, is much more difficult than one would expect. And it also, you know, led me to realize that citizenship and naturalization for these um, military workers, it's a way for the military to manage the labor force, right? So, because... You know, security clearances are tied to having citizenship. If you don't have citizenship, you are, you know, can only have certain occupations and um, can be an officer, of course. Um, but also, like the military, what it needs you to get citizenship. So you, you can do certain things and have certain occupations. You know, it might facilitate that for you. Um, so it, it became a story that's not just about what an individual immigrant might want or their goals um, as far as getting citizenship and, you know, their military career, but also very much about what the military needs as it's managing its labor force. And it's interesting because the first thing that, one of the things that really rang true to me was people explaining that while the routes did exist, and in some cases, USCIS was more accommodating to things like, uh, you have one example of an interviewee who their paperwork had been frustrated because they lived in the barracks. And so they weren't getting the mail they were supposed to be getting uh, from USCIS. Um, but, you know, 
even with that being said, that the challenge was having the, the ability, the freedom, the time to go and collect the things you would need to collect to submit an application. Um, you, you have, uh, I believe it was, uh, you have a guy, one of your interviewees was a guy named John who was from Malaysia. And he talks about this. There's a quote, I'm going to quote him directly from the book where he says, you know, when in the service, it's kind of different when you're out in the field or working or doing something on a mission. You can't, you don't even have the time to deal with all this legal paperwork. That's the reason why they make it easier for you. You don't want to get interrupted. Like, oh, you know what? You have to go and do all this legal, legal paperwork. You can take off, you can go. No, there's no such thing. You have to be there 24 seven. You're a soldier. You're 24 seven. People can call you anytime to get up, to get to do whatever you would work or something like that. We just don't have time to deal with all this legal paperwork. And I thought about that because I had a couple of soldiers who naturalized and it was during the, the this would have been from 09 onward. But yeah, just like anything else in the military, when people need something that it's not, the command doesn't necessarily make a priority for them to get done, finding the time is such a challenge. And it's like, then though, if they don't, as you, you talk about later in the book, you have so much exposure to potentially being deported for so many different reasons. And, you know, not being a U.S. citizen will limit you in, in, in many capacities in the military and outside when it comes to jobs. And so if it, it's interesting that it feels like people assume, I believe, that this is this huge inducement to enlistment, but it actually feels like many, it is true for some people, but for many others, the becoming a U.S. citizen part isn't necessarily the reason they enlisted. And frankly, even if that's the thing they want to do, uh, before 2004, before 2009, and then after 2016, it's a challenge to do that. The military will happily take your labor and your, you know, <laughs> your body and uh, use it as it sees fit. But when it comes to this thing that you're technically entitled to, uh, you have to fight for it. And if if someone in your chain of command wants to impede that process, they can, and there's very little recourse. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a great summary. I mean, the immigration system for anyone who has had to deal with it, whether for themselves or for a loved one, it, it, it's like a labyrinth, right? It takes mm -hmm. um, a lot, you know, it helps if you have an attorney, which is expensive, but it is, but yeah. without an attorney, it's like expensive. There's, um, you, you know, I have appointments and uh, things go wrong a lot. You know, I myself is naturalized as an adult and, um, I was the last one to naturalize in my family because my paperwork was lost <laughs> in, the, mm -hmm. in transit and then I aged out. And so I had to do it as an adult, not as a, you know, a, a minor. Um, and that is not an unusual experience. And so you have this kind of complicated process where you're supposed to be, you know, informing the immigration authorities of, of where you live and you, and you move. So you probably don't want to move too much. So you don't lose anything. Um, you know, especially like, you know, before recent years where some of this stuff is online. Um, and that is a very hard to combine with military lifestyle, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Taking days off, right? To, to drive, and bases are located sometimes so far away from the closest USCIS office. So you have to, you know, take a bunch of time off to go to this appointment and then another appointment. Then, you know, something gets lost in the mail. Then you are maybe stationed outside of the United States, which for, you know, most of the U.S. history, you can't naturalize outside of the United States. So then, then what? Um, so there's missed appointments. You know, people who are trying, uh, just we're really encountering a bunch of obstacles. And, you know, there's, of course, a tragic case, I think, in 2004, where someone, you know, had to go get another set of fingerprints um, for, you know, even though obviously the military had this person's fingerprints, yeah. again, for immigration purposes, and then got killed on the way. Yeah. Um, so these are like two really huge bureaucracies, you know, lots of paperwork and they're, you know, in, kind of incompatible with each other. And the people are stuck between the gears of these two systems. That's how I, I think about it. Um, and then, you know, you said the second part of what you said. Absolutely. I found that even though I think a lot of people who are aware that you don't have to be a citizen to serve in the military, which a lot of people are surprised, but just that fact alone um, they assume that that's why you're joining. Yeah, that you're gonna have this, you know, fast track to citizenship. But most of the immigrants that are joining up, they they grew up in the U.S. Mm -hmm. You know, for, for for most of their lives, you know, they they had you know gone to school in the U.S. and they're enlisting for what I found 
very similar reasons to everybody else. You know, maybe they want to pay for college. Maybe they love guns. Um, you know, there's, if when we see like citizenship as an interest is folks who are, for example, have had family members deported. And so they're really mm-hmm. like aware of like, I want to get this protection or people who came to the U S as young adults yeah. who otherwise have to wait a long time. Um, they're like, Oh, and, and they might have a, like a special situation. Like they want to sponsor the migration of a family member. Um, but for the most part, you know, that's, a lot of people didn't don't even know that citizenship is no. a, a fast track to citizenship is something they will get through the military. It's not on their radar. They're trying to, to, to show the recruiter that, you know, they qualify. <laughs> it's not even, it wasn't even on their minds, like what citizenship means. And as you said, like, unfortunately, that means they could get deported later. Yeah. And thousands of people have been deported. You have an interesting story in here from one of your interviewees. And, you know, I'm reminded because I face a similar situation. So I, I live in the United Kingdom. Um, I'm actually a UK citizen because one of these strange stories, my my grandfather was stationed in England and married an English woman and uh, then tried to abscond. And finally, his family caught up with him and uh, her, her family did. And his command forced him to bring his family to America. So in, for the first two years of her life, my mom was uh, was, for all intents and purposes, just a British citizen. She was a child in Britain. She didn't have any tie to America. Uh, she naturalized, I think, as a child. And so in 1983, they changed the laws here that made it so women could pass on British citizenship. Because before then, only men, only British men could pass on citizenship, uh, which is mind-blowing. And, and it feels like also hilariously, it's like that is a strange kind of positive change. But that also, at the same time that went into effect, they eliminated birthright citizenship in this country. Um, which was another thing that the you know started as a far right thing in the '60s and then became a thing in mainstream politics in the UK by the early '80s. And I bring this up because most British people have no idea how uh, labyrinthine or expensive the British immigration system is. It's unbelievably expensive. I mean, looking at some, I was surprised looking at some of these prices. Like these are onerous costs for Americans, for enlisted soldiers especially. But in Britain, the cost is you know. Uh, probably three to four times as much um, for each visa. But then also there are stories in here where I'm like, I cannot believe because I didn't realize being, I was born in the United States. uh, I didn't realize some of these rules were in effect. And there's one particular example I wanted to draw from in your book. So you, you interviewed someone who had talked about being in America on a H-1B visa. Uh, It was a guy named Ravi. And he came to the U.S. to study IT in graduate school and was in the U.S. And this is his quote. He says, in the United States, the immigration system is broken, regardless of how qualified you are, especially if you're from India or China. If you have a master's degree and your employer sponsors the green card, assuming that you're lucky enough that you secure an H-1B visa, it would take at least 25 years, if not more, to get a green card. So I just felt I don't want to be in this modern day slavery and stuck with an employer. So I thought about, you know, as you put it, enlisting through Mavni would be a nice way for me to, you know, actually be a part of the country where I want to live. That is unbelievable to me. And like I said, I had no idea. I had no idea that you could, because in this country, the UK is, is like wants to be a prison, prison fortress. But if you get a visa, work visa, and you work here for five years, unless it's like one of these new visas they've created for migrant workers where there's no path to settlement skilled worker visas in this country, if you live here for five years, at the most 10 years, if they think you're like a security risk, you can naturalize or you can at least get permanent residency. I had no idea that you would have to work for 25 years in the US in or- on an H-1B visa in order to get a green card, which is still not citizenship. That's, un- that's unbelievable. And so in that regard, you know, the, 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 the motto, the, the position of this show is always don't join the military. But I look at a guy like Ravi and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Part of me is like, man, I hope they don't screw you over because the, the military loves to do that to people to promise things and not deliver. And Mavni is a great example of that. And we'll talk about that later. But I don't know what I would do. I mean, I felt the same way when I was, um, I did a six month uh, temporary assignment in Honduras. And working in Honduras, I just, I seen conditions are like for, for working people, for people who don't have family money. I absolutely understood that anyone who, who wanted to get away from it would want to go to America despite all the risks because the situation is just so dire, both in terms of your personal security and just the opportunities available. And it's like, it wasn't until I saw it up close. I'm like, oh, this, yeah, if I was a young Honduran, I would absolutely go to America because like you just, the deck is so stacked against you. And similarly, in this case, like, you know, 
almost 10 years removed from being out of the army, I would not want to enlist. I would not want to go back in. But I can understand why I got to look at the situation saying my only route to staying in America and not being basically deportable if I lose my job for, for 25 years is to enlist. Like, I understand it. And that to me, I feel like something that I appreciate about this book and why, you know, I definitely want to recommend it to our listeners is there's an exploration of this stuff that makes you realize like we as a country, as Americans love putting immigrants in impossible positions. And this feels like an example of that. And so drawing on this, I guess I wanted to ask like your reaction to that, but also like, you know, that's one anecdote. Were there other anecdotes, other stories where you were really, really surprised when, when you, you met people who had enlisted, who had joined the military and then discovered like that they were facing situations this stark, you know, that, that the reason they enlisted was because, you know, it, it, it offered something that they simply weren't going to be able to get elsewhere. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Um, so these cases were, for the most part, um, through the special program that you mentioned, the MAVNI program, which stands for Military Accessions of Vital National um, Interest or Importance. Mm-hmm. I always forget which one it is. Um, and that was, you know, it only lasted like 10 years and 10,000 people were enlisted through that. And that's when it was opened up to people like Ravi who were on high-skilled visa, the H-1B visa. Because normally you have to have a green card. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was kind of the bullet in time where they opened it up to more. And it was super competitive. You know, there was like people with PhDs enlisting, um, you know, things like that. And, it, you know, Ravi's case... Um, it is totally true. Like the waiting times are so long, especially as he's pointing out for immigrants from India and China, because there's just like a much longer waiting line for those, because we have kind of ceilings per country. And that's why that's, that's causing And at the end of that 25 years, you know, lots of people still, you know, are not able to get permanently lawful residency. So it's not like a guarantee. There's just lots of, lots of uncertainty and, you know, you're set up for exploitation uh, by your employer because yeah. you're depending on your employer for immigration um, papers. And I would say, like, there were definitely, like, a couple of cases that of, of people that were in desperate straits and they saw enlistment a, as a solution. So there was one um, young woman whose brother was fighting a deportation case. And she was working, she was uh, a foreign student, so there are like extreme limitations on being able to work on those mm-hmm. visas. So she was working for like the low minimum wage at a gas station while wow. attending community college. Um, and, you know, like her family, like just <laughs> desperate for, for, for money to, to try to fight the deportation of her brother. So she enlisted for the bonus, yeah. you know, that gave her $10,000 uh, that she could, you know, help her family. And so... <laughs> You know, that that comes to mind is like one of the more desperate cases. I, I wanted to broaden this because one of the things you, you talk about at times in this book is uh, the term that you, we hear sometimes used describing military recruitment and the way the military um, induces or entices people to join us, the poverty draft. And that can be a contentious subject. Um, and I'm always interested in learning more because, I mean, my background is both my parents are army officers. And so when I was in high school, I played sports. The army was like, do you want a scholarship to go to college for free? And I said, sure. You know, it was 2002. And I didn't think that any of the stuff that was happening post 9-11 was going to last. I certainly didn't think it was going to last uh, after, you know, to go on past 2007, which was when I would be graduating from university. And so I, I and then I, I wound up liking the training, uh, you know, do, and wound up becoming an infantry officer. Uh, but my background wasn't, wasn't, induced by poverty at all. It wasn't my parents where I would say solidly middle class. It was more that, uh, you know, my basically every, all but one male in my family had been in the military. And so it wasn't even there like, you must do this as a legacy thing. It was more like, it was such a common vocation. It was such a, so many people did it that when I expressed interest, it wasn't like, oh, is this momentous decision? It's just like, oh yeah, the army, the army's great. Like, yeah, you know, it, it can be a great career if you, if you take it seriously, like, you know, look into that. And then I think certainly at the back of their minds was, uh, you don't have to pay college tuition. Uh, because even in 2003, when I was starting starting school, tuition was incredibly expensive and it's only gotten, you know, it's gotten exponentially worse. Um, so I, I bring that, like I said, not as like a special dispensation, but more that when I see talk of 
poverty draft and I hear people kind of say that, you know, cite one research study or another and say, actually, it's not true. Actually, everyone who joins the military is middle class. I feel like th- there's a lot of depth and nuance lacking there, um, you know, completely removing my own experience from it, just because in terms of what I think of what I saw, what I experienced in terms of like the people that I was in the military with. And I think also an un- a lack of understanding from a lot of people that uh, the military does offer a kind of trade-off of job security and, and uh, what you would call kind of like social safety net benefits to people and to their families that fundamentally don't exist in jobs in America, certainly not jobs where you don't need a college degree, or in the case of, of what we're describing here, you don't even necessarily need to be a citizen as long as you're a permanent resident. But I mean, I, I definitely experienced people who enlisted, you know, just because like they were bored or they didn't have anything else going on or they didn't like, they tried going to college, they didn't like it. But I, when you brought up the story of the, 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 your interview subject who had um, gotten the bonus to pay off, to help pay a family's immigration lawyer fees for trying to keep her brother in the country, I was reminded of I had a soldier who, it was a really tough conversation having to kind of break the news to him that he couldn't uh, use DEERS, the system for military dependents uh, benefits, to put his younger sisters and his disabled father on, you know, as benefits, beneficiaries where they would then receive TRICARE and military uh, insurance, health insurance, because his father was a roofer and he'd broken his back. He couldn't work. His family lived in Arkansas in extreme poverty. He basically never did anything off, off base. He never left the barracks because he, every bit of money that he had, he sent home to his family. And, you know, by the time I met him, he was maybe 19 and he'd already been deployed to Iraq for, I think he was a late arrival, but he had been in Iraq in uh, oh. Oh, six to 07, you know, for probably at least six months. And then he then subsequently deployed to Afghanistan, you know, uh, a little over a year after getting back from Iraq. So he was absolutely like, he was an infantry, enlisted infantryman. So he was absolutely kind of like the, the, where the rubber meets the road in terms of like the, the least glamorous, the most exposed job you could be in, in the army at least. And his reason for enlistment was absolutely was poverty. Like it was a thing that, you know, would, provide benefits to his family. Um, and a number of situations like this where people, if not the reason they joined, it was the reason they stayed in. Because especially if they were married, they had kids, they realized very quickly, like, what you get on the outside is, yes, you're, you're, if you work a civilian job, they will not call you in on Saturday morning to punish you because someone in a different company you know, got a DUI, but you won't have the guarantees of um, housing and healthcare for you and your family and educational benefits, even if those are uh, as you, and I appreciate you highlighting this in the book, even if those are typically administered by private companies through government subcontracting. Um, and oftentimes there's a lot of grift involved. Um, we've talked about poor, the poor quality of, of on-base housing on this show with people, with advocates numerous times. And so I guess I bring up, this is a long kind of digression, but I wanted to tell my, that story. I'm interested in your perspective as a sociologist, as an academic, about like when people talk about the poverty draft, you know, when this is discussed, you know, in research materials, in, 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 in professional assessments, how, how would you describe it? How would it be described? Because I feel like it's something that my last point before I hand it over, I refrain from kind of using it as a kind of catch all term, because I realize that at least when you're talking on social media, for example, when you're in the line of work I'm in, that there's a lot of uh, people kind of see that as kind of like a, like a get out of jail free card to say like, oh, well, you know, because people join the military because of the dire circumstances they're in, then you're arguing somehow that that means that they're not in any way responsible at all for any of the bigger picture things the military does. And I don't think that that's, that's not, a, that's not an argument I would make at all. Um, but knowing that that often takes you down a rabbit hole of that kind of argument and, and people kind of assuming that's what you're saying, don't really talk about it. But I was interested in, in, in you because you, especially in this book, spoke to a number of people who that was fundamentally their reason for enlisting. It was that the social economic circumstances they were in were such that the military provided an option that would let them escape a situation or improve a situation that they would not otherwise be able to improve or escape. Um, so I, I promise I'll stop talking now. Uh, and I know I, I appreciate you, uh, you bearing with me on this one. So yeah, I'd just love to know your thoughts on that concept of the poverty draft, how you'd explain it and you know, any other points that I've raised. Right. And I think it's such an important point um, to emphasize that, you know, human beings have agency. We make choices that are, you know, they're made in constrained circumstances, but 
you know, there, there are still choices. And that, that's what I would say, first of all, as a sociologist, right? So, um, and in terms of the poverty draft, so, you know, this, this may not surprise you, but um, a lot of research, or, uh, research on the military is funded by the military, right? It's mm-hmm. f- funded by the Department of Defense. So they're not going to use the term poverty draft. When you see it in academic spaces, it's primarily um, long academics who are studying counter recruitment. Right. Or like writing critical takes on especially historical, you know, um, subjects having to do with the U.S. military. Like much of their research is funded by the military. And we have to always remember that, like people's positions, the grants, the conferences, like there's a huge flow of money into that. I will say, of course, <laughs> I, yeah, my work is not. But um, but when I think about the poverty draft, I think it, or explaining it to folks, I it's always important to remember that like the most marginalized people are not going to be able to join the military, mm-hmm. right? You're not going to be able to like pass the barriers into enlistment, which do exist, right? As much as they're wider than the mirror, you know, like over time. That was the thing that I, w- I, I forgot to add. And I want to say is that that's the one thing from my perspective too, is that people will say, Oh, well, it's only middle-class people joining the military. It's like, well, that, that misunderstands class in America. And, and perhaps that's true in the sense also that people who are, at the extreme end of poverty in America are typically ineligible because of health, because of the carceral state that finds ways to criminalize them from very, very early age to the point where by the time they would even be able to enlist at 17 with parental consent, they already have too much of a criminal record to enlist. I mean, fun, fun, so I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah, that that's a point I, I was like, yeah, I wish people were aware in the same way that I wish people were aware that if, if someone, like you said, just because someone enlists... Uh, as a green card holder and is technically eligible doesn't mean they're safe from deportation if they don't naturalize or just if somebody enlists and they serve in combat that doesn't mean they're granted veterans benefits if they're uh, other than honorably discharged things along those lines I, I wish people knew that but I'm really sorry I, I jumped in I'll, I'll stop talking no no totally fine um, yeah so obviously there's barriers to enlistment and the most marginalized folks are not going to be able to enlist and you know we can kind of talk about you know, what is middle class and how you define it. You know, I think like what research shows is that most Americans would like to identify themselves as middle class, even those who are in dire poverty and the very wealthy. Everybody's middle class. Yeah. Um, but if we look at, for example, I, um, you know, debt is such a key uh, mechanism of how you know much of our society works, right? And the, looking at the role of debt, the anticipation of debt, trying to prevent debt or dealing with the debt you already have is a huge part of the, like what's driving enlistment for a lot of folks. Like whether you're trying to avoid taking on six figures of debt to get a college degree, Mm -hmm. or if you already have debt and if you have too much debt, of course that you can't enlist. Or if you already are in the military and you have too much debt, that has like very serious consequences for you. And um, you might even, you know, be less than honorably, other than honorably discharged. Yeah. Um, So, you know, rather than focusing like on, well, how much income do the person's parents like earn sure. know, in the year before they enlisted, they, you know, like looking at economic factors more broadly uh, indicates like the, the role of kind of just economics and finances and people's decisions to enlist or not. And I think like uh, the DOD has um, like a regular poll it conducts to try to, you know, understand why people don't enlist and there's a huge <laughs> crisis in recruitment. And like, I looked at the latest, um, thing, you know, for the last couple of years and the, you know, consistently one of the very, very top reasons for why, you know, American youth might enlist, they, they check off paying for college. Right. So it doesn't mean that they're in poverty, right? Like lots of people also don't go to college, but that's an economic reason right there. Absolutely. That that's why military also really does not like cancel, you know, the idea of canceling student debt, yeah. making college free or having a higher minimum wage, <laughs> any of these things. Yeah, I appreciated that notion, the, the thing you, you highlighted that where data was available in Washington State, since they were one of the first places to raise their minimum wage uh, to $15 an hour, that military recruitment had dropped. And I mean, quite frankly, like if you're 18, 19 and you're looking for a job and the family you know, considerations, the social welfare stuff isn't necessarily the top priority. It's hard to look at what the military entails and then also look at your annual salary as a, you know, E1, E2 in the army 
and say to yourself, I'm willing to sacrifice all freedom, all autonomy for what effectively amounts to, um, I mean, it doesn't include all of the other things that they do give, but in terms of sheer dollars, it's less than what you'd earn working full time at $15 an hour. Um, but totally, then, although you're like presuming that the 17 year old is like rationally weighing. Of course. Uh, yeah. 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 Well I mean, like, like me famously rational when I was, <laughs> I think I was 20 and I signed a contract obligating myself for seven years active duty. It didn't even have to be that long, but I thought to myself like, oh, you know, like there's some benefits I might get, you know, I'd never been on active duty a single day. And then I <laughs> thought I could get at it four years because they, they, they seem to have lost the paperwork and then they found the paperwork again. So I, I wound up spending seven years on active duty. <laughs> so yeah, great rational decision making that I made. And I was older than 17 for sure. I, I, but I, I bring that up too, because I was thinking about this, my experience, I went to CUNY uh, for graduate school after I got out of the army. And because I had a hundred percent GI bill, um, I was eligible because even though my first four years in the army were paying back the uh, ROTC sort of debt of, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't physically, uh, you know, I wasn't losing funds from my paycheck, but I had a service obligation for four years because I, they had paid for effectively three years of undergraduate tuition. But then the GI Bill, they passed the new GI Bill uh, while I was brand new on active duty. And so I, I got out and I went to CUNY and CUNY immediately made me an in-state student and basically waived all of my tuition. And so like, obviously I still had housing costs, but the, the housing allowance was quite generous. I mean, in New York City compared to elsewhere in, in the country or in the world really, because it's a flat rate abroad. So, um, but in New York, they give, while school is in session, they give a very generous amount of money for what we call BAH or basic allowance for housing. And I just thought to myself, like this, this allows the level of not like it, it reduces the amount of stress and anxiety about school, what you're going to study, how school's going to go, et cetera. And I'm not, once again, I'm not saying, oh, by that, everyone should just enlist. No, you absolutely shouldn't. But, but I realized how strong of an inducement that is. Because for me, I didn't know about it at the time. I mean, it, 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 I, I knew about it in the sense of getting a free undergraduate uh, education. Uh, but looking at it now, if you were, you know, weighing your options and you, know, you read the pamphlet for what the GI Bill entails, you do three years on active duty. And for example, if you go to school at a state school, um, many of them make you in state. And so you only pay in state tuition. Uh, you get basic allowance for housing. You get a book stipend, things along those lines. And um, like getting a four-year undergraduate degree at CUNY from being a, a three years active duty would effectively, I mean, it wouldn't be free, but it would be very, very low cost. And similarly, SUNY or other other state systems uh, on the East Coast do this. Not every state does it, but a number of them do where, where basically, and if you go to a private school, like oftentimes the, v, the GI Bill maxes out, but there are programs that exist to match that difference so that you don't actually go out of pocket um, uh, on tuition. And so you look at that and it's like, yeah, that's, you can see how many people would look at that and say, okay, I'm willing to forego so much. But what I find interesting about the, the, the topic at hand in your book is the fact that many people don't enlist for that and don't even take advantage of those benefits, even though they're there. That's not the only reason. And just like you said, you know, here, many of, the, of your interview subjects did eventually naturalize, but not through the military. And, and their reason for joining was not, hey, this is an expedited process to US citizenship. Yeah. So there were a lot of like I would say there are a lot of reasons, and I, I'd love to to just kind of if you if you want to talk about those now, just the v wide variety of reasons that you encountered for why people joined, why they made the decision to enlist, uh, you know, that weren't explicitly tied to the fact that there um, there was some assistance available for naturalization. Yeah, and I, I want to go back to the story you shared about yourself, and um, you know, having you know parents who are in the military and, and grandparents. Um, Research does show that that's a strong predictor of someone enlisting or, you know, being in the military. Also, living in proximity to a military base is another thing that predicts that. So it's, it's, not, it, it's not just economic factors, right? There's cultural factors, too, and, you know, family. And with immigrants, which is who I was interviewing for this book, it was super interesting. Like, people had family legacies of military service, too, but in other countries, yeah. sometimes in countries that were had been in conflict with the U.S., but kind of the, the militarist kind of ethos from it, yeah. or specifically kind of the warrior masculinity images was, like, still affecting how they thought about who they are and what they should do and, and how their parents and family members were kind of, you know, socializing as, as they were growing up. Um, 
in yeah, it could get very interesting. Like somebody, like I had several people that I talked to who had done their mandatory military service in Korea. Yeah, I was going to bring up Korea. That's a great example. Right. And, and what we should also remember, you know, of course, there was the Korean War and yeah. like just incredible devastation wrought by U.S. military on yeah. Korea and the, all the military bases there now. So the presence of U.S. military is very heavy in Korea. Yeah, I I, I was stationed there. That was my last assignment was but when I made the decision to get out and I was really like morally and mentally checked out of being in the army. I got stationed in South Korea in area one, right? Not right on the DMZ, but about 10 kilometers from the DMZ. And yeah, you see that a lot. You see two things. I guess, number one, the degree to which the US military presence in Korea just is so, especially that close to the border, is so incredibly onerous and how much it affects Korean citizens' lives just by presence, by the economy. But then also, I think, and because th- th- I realizing this point, wa- one of your interview subjects talked about how he was doing his military service, his mandatory draft service in Korea, and was taken to an American base by one of his superior officers. And the experience of seeing what an American military base was like made him think, I want to join the U.S. military. Like this is to me, this is what being in the army should be like. I may be paraphrasing wrong, but that's very interesting to me because I did some when I was there. I had some exercises where we were working with the the we would call the Rock Army, the Republic of Korea Army. And the conditions for their draft conscript soldiers are very, very poor, very poor. And they have almost no freedom at all. And it's they get paid next to nothing. The only time they get off is basically like, I think they get a 48 hour or 72 hour pass each time they promote. They're not when they when they do get base liberty, they're not allowed to take off their uniforms like their lives are so incredibly strictly controlled. And so to me, I would think if I had that experience and then I'd be like, well, as soon as this is done, I'm, I'm for sure not doing anything in the military ever again. But I realized that for the people, it's different. And I, I'll, I'll stop interrupting now. But yeah, that, the Korean example like loomed large when I read it in the book because, yeah, that's, that's an environment where... And, and there are a ton of people, you encounter them, I encounter them, who are you know, born Korean citizens and then immigrate to the United States and enlist in the U.S. military. Yeah, totally. And I think, you know, of course, I'm interviewing the ones who did enlist. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we also have to remember there's like huge, vibrant opposition movements mm-hmm. to U.S. military presence in Korea. But the, the ones that enlist, they do have this story. Like people, um, especially when they have this kind of, if they're middle class in Korea and they have this experience with mandatory military service that, that just kind of strips them of the privileges of being middle class. And, you know, for, for this particular person that I talked to, like visiting a U.S. military base, like kind of restored some of that what he had lost in status, um, and, and and you know planted the seed for eventually joining the U.S. military when he he immigrated. Did you ever encounter people who talked about uh, either being Katusas or working with Katusas? Did you experience that at all? So it's Korean Army augmentee to U.S. Army. Uh, they're basically a it's kind of a funnel program, and as I understand it, it's typically kind of a a thing afforded to people of high status, like high social status in Korea, people from wealthy families. You typically have to speak English very well to get in, although the the actual level of English proficiency varies. But basically, you serve as in the ranks of the US military for your conscript service. And you are in a special kind of Korean detachment. You have a Korean army sergeant major in every battalion who is in charge of the Katusas. But I also met some regular Korean army conscripts who have, some of them were like born and raised. One guy was from New Zealand. One guy was from Australia. One guy was from America. They'd come back to do their military service. And they had such a negative impression of these guys because they were like, oh, they're basically, they're not even soldiers. They don't go through the stuff that we go through. They get such an easy life. And you realize like there is a social penalty paid if you are a male South Korean citizen and you don't do military service, but there is a way to do your military service that isn't quite as what you're describing, that complete, uh, stripping of freedom and autonomy and individuality that, you know, they go through when you know, at age 20, basically, like, you know, they, 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 they get to do two years of university if they're going to university. And then suddenly it's like, no, now for the next two and a half years, you are the property of the state. And you're going to, I don't know how much they get paid now, but back when I was in, it was like 75 US dollars a month. They get basically nothing. And so it's, it's I, I, like it's a digression here, but yeah, it, it's, it's such a, it's such a strange it's such a strange experience. And to me, I think the thing that always surprises me is that many, many people who do this then come out of it and they are very, they are very pro-military. They're very pro, in some cases, U.S. military. Um, and as you described, some of them then go on to then join the U.S. military 
Uh, much like there was similar to Mavni, I remember there was a program for interpreters uh, who got special immigrant visas, people who had been interpreters in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they could then turn around and enlist um, in like a, like, a, like a qualified linguist role. And I, I had, I, I don't know if I had anybody I worked with in Afghanistan who did do that, but I had a number of them who expressed interest in it because it was a route to, um, to being able to get U.S. citizenship and uh, eventually be able to get a top secret clearance, which would entail, allow them to become a uh, category three interpreter and make amounts of money that would just change, that would, would change their lives and their families' lives. Yeah, absolutely. I think we also like related to that. Um, you know, it's important to remember just like how much the U.S. military relies on contractors, right? Mm -hmm. and, abroad. and so like, if you think about who is working as contract labor in all of these places the U.S. military is at, it is often not even just lo local workers, but migrant workers from other places like the Philippines, for example. Um, and then I, I met a couple of people whose parents had done that as contract labor. Okay. Um, and then so like their connection, the U.S. military is just like so huge, spread across the globe. There's all these different ways that people are connected to it. And for some people, it can result eventually in this path to enlistment. Yeah. I mean, a friend of mine uh, stayed in the Army and became a Special Forces officer. And he told me that he was involved. He was on an exercise when... Uh, the super typhoon struck in the Philippines in 2013. And so his team got mobilized to go out and you know, basically do anything you can to open up this airfield so they can bring in relief flights. And when they were there, basically like they had one person, I think on their team who spoke passable Tagalog, but they couldn't really communicate with many of the people. But there was a uh, Navy ship, the US Navy, a couple of ships from one of the, the, the Pacific fleet nearby. And they were like, in satellite radio contact, they're like, literally, whatever dialect you need to speak, whatever language you need to speak, we can find someone. Because like, Philippine, people of Filipino origin are so unbelievably overrepresented in the US Navy. And you talk about that in the book, that Subic Bay and the presence there was such a thing where it presented itself as this, it was as both this like, this presence there that had significantly negative consequences, but also for many people, it was like a route to do other things. And now those communities are heavily, heavily represented. I think about that sometimes that, yeah, like basically the army for all the money that it spends wasn't able to supply them with someone who could uh, translate and, you know, actually communicate effectively there on site. But because the U.S. Navy recruits from Filipino Americans and, and, and people who are green card holders from the Philippines, they had they were spoiled for choice, basically. Like that's kind of the, there was kind of a joke and maybe it seems a little off color that my friend said, but he's like the, the Navy and CEOs have been like, dude, this is the one place in the world you don't have to worry. Like basically all of the below decks ranks in the U.S. Navy are Filipino. Yeah. And that's an important point, right? The, in terms of the ranks, the inequity yeah. that like, the, you know, the Philippines was colonized by the U.S., right? And the colonized subjects, that, those are the ranks they're funneled to. And of course, they're like the, the Filipino school fought in World War II mm -hmm. uh, next, you know, next to U.S., forces and then did not get their citizenship for many decades. Um, but I think like your point about the allocation of labor is very important because that was really interesting for me. Um, and having heard on your podcast, many, many examples of various inefficiencies and absurdities <laughs> in the way the military works. I was like, yeah. that's what they were talking about because all the like, 10,000 of these mommies enlist and yeah. supposedly their skill of national importance is being able to speak one of the 50 plus languages that are of you know potential enemies of the US and they had expected to use those languages the vast majority of them never used those languages they were stationed in totally different countries yeah i mean like you know that's that's like a, a just another one of so many examples we we used to joke about this cuz i remember hearing a story about someone who said that they had a friend who enlisted uh or actually did ROTC and um was a native Farsi speaker and they wound up, you'd think that person would be funneled into some sort of thing where Farsi language skills would be important. And obviously like if you're going to be an officer, that's not as much the case because typically that's not your job. But even if you had enlisted, sometimes this is the case. This person wound up getting classed as transportation and they were deployed to Iraq and people were, you'd think like, wouldn't you want to send that person to Afghanistan where they literally speak Daria is very, very close. If it's, 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 functionally in intelligible between the two. It's like, no. And the point, the joke we used to make is that when people react that way, you can gauge how familiar they are with the army from their reaction. If they're surprised that the army takes a native Farsi speaker and makes them be a truck driver in Iraq, 
then they haven't experienced it. Whereas if you've been in, you're like, oh yeah, that's, yeah, they, they just, they just don't, they don't actually use it. But you brought up Mavni and I, I wanted to, 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 to maybe kind of segue if, if, if you wanted to, to talk about that a bit, because you did quite a bit of research about this program and the kind of Mavni limbo and the way in which many people were recruited, as you said, in one of the subheads of, the, uh, of your, your book, said that they were recruited because they were foreign and then basically were deemed security risks because they were too foreign. Yeah, exactly. So this is that special program um, that ran from like around 2007 to 2017. And um, it, it was mostly foreign students and some like temporary employment visas and a couple of other categories. But it was like, basically, um, you could enlist on these temporary visas that you normally could not if you had this skill of vital national importance. There were a few physicians, but the vast majority were through these language skills and they had to take a language test. Um, and the sub- subtitle of my book is Between Model Immigrant and Security Threat. And you could see that play out with these Mavni soldiers, right? So, you know, they're celebrated, like some of them are soldier of the year, like they like have amazing credentials for somebody who was in the lowest ranks, uh, you know, master's degree, PhDs, like, and there was so much, like so many stories told about just how exceptional with the quality these immigrants are um but like almost immediately there's also like are they spies like right? <laughs> you know um and that results like this swinging back and forth um between you know celebrating like this the best kind of immigrant mm-hmm. and just profound suspicion that they experienced also a lot of them told me while they were serving like they, they were referred to as mavnis and in people's minds they were like a special category of like foreigner that you couldn't trust what happened is towards the end of the program, they started instituting, you know, all of these really drastic, you know, um, security clearances that people had to pass and that were like impossible for an immigrant to pass because some of the questions were like about your ties to people in foreign countries, which like if you yeah. migrated, you do have. I mean, I struggled with this when I was getting my TS clearance. I eventually got it. But my interviewer was really hostile because of having foreign contacts. And it's just sort of like, well, my mom's a British citizen and my dad was stationed in Germany and we lived off base. So I'm still friends with people I went to school with when I was a kid and they're German citizens. My brother's lived in Japan for 10 years. I know some of his friends were friends on face. They like, literally, she was like, anyone you're friends with on Facebook, who's not a a US citizen, we need to to know about. And I'm like, I just said, ma'am, that's, that's going to be impossible. I mean, hilariously, my friends who are still in the army now have to list me as a foreign contact because I didn't get my British passport until after I got out of the army. Uh, one of the stories you had uh, in here about a guy who was a Dutch citizen who felt kind of bittersweet about having to give up his, he knew he wouldn't be able to renew his Dutch passport because once he became an American citizen, that their, their rules are such. And that was the reason why I waited actually was I thought I was eligible, but I was like, I don't want to get this and then have to give it up and then have to actually renounce my British citizenship. Uh, you know, I'm an American and we'll see what happens. I think I'm eligible. And then once I got out, um, I was in fact, but it's strange how, you know, you could be called upon to renounce it entirely. And like you said, security clearance things, they genuinely, it feels as though they are shocked and suspicious if you know anyone who's not American citizen. And as you said, like if you have to list your ties to foreign nationals, like if you were an immigrant, especially if you came here as a young adult and you didn't come with your family, basically everyone in your life from before you moved to America. (laughs) Like, so I get it. Yeah. They, that would put many people at a really, really serious disadvantage to being able to pass your security clearance. Totally. And then, you know, then the people would, you know, sign, you know, sign their, their contract and then just would get stuck at that stage. Um, and their ship date would just be moved and moved. And, you know, there would, there were stories like, you know, people packed up, got ready to go, you know, you know, ended their lease, sold their car over and over and over. Oh, quit wow. school, Right. Or, you know, like if they were in graduate school and, and, and it just kept delay, getting delayed, delayed. And it was like, a, like three years and they were just legally in limbo as immigrants. Because if your visa is predicated on being a student, right? Yeah. And, and so people were, you know, worried about being deported. There were people who were like, I have to file for asylum now because (laughs) yeah and if you overstay then you technically could be in violation and if that comes up then you're really you know up the creek when it comes to uscis because you've violated immigration laws and it's like 
And it's funny, there's a line in the book where you, you, you basically said, you talk about the, what you call the politics of deservingness. And you say the politics of deservingness is understandable and widespread in the US immigrants rights movement. And immigrant veterans are perhaps the most extreme manifestation of the deservingness mer- narrative since they risk life and health for a country that has not even yet given them citizenship. And before we close out, I want to talk about deported veterans. But I also say, what's interesting to me is I agree with you in that assessment 100%. And what is shouldn't come as a surprise given that I, the time I spent in the military, but still is a surprise is the degree to which like you have in parallel or in tandem, you have that deservingness narrative and then the actual way that people are treated administratively, which is terrible, which is seems to be like disposable and, uh, you know, like Kafkaesque really, like, in the way that this is happening. And that doesn't seem to have, I mean, there is an outcry in the sense that there's also been an outcry about deported veterans, but it's not like enough to, in my opinion, it doesn't seem like it's enough to really change this dynamic significantly there may be improvements made but like the military in my experience has done this and continues to you know what i mean with when it comes to programs things along these lines in which they don't necessarily they are not obligated to care about the individual effects on the people who are eligible because they see all of the eligibility and the the subsequent benefits as you know a privilege and they never think of like, what are you doing to someone who literally can't go home because they then can't reenter the country, who can't stay in school, can't work, can't seek secure housing while they're waiting on an administrative decision that, let's be honest, is probably being out processed to a civilian contractor. Absolutely. I mean, I think that the, the way that our culture is set up is often to just put immigrants in perpetual debt. Mm-hmm. Like, so you just, you are to be grateful for whatever it is you got. Um, and like, there's not ever like a finish line where you can stop proving yourself and yeah. proving your deservingness. Um, and that, you know, just really helps hide, um, you know, with the whole story about the nation of immigrants, it really hides what, how this nation was founded on slavery and genocide of indigenous people. Because if we start from that starting point, the story is quite different about folks who've had to move to the United States from, from other places, particularly those who have been displaced directly yeah. by the U.S. military, right? And that's why they come into the U.S. and then they are recruited into the military and the cycle continues. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think about this sometimes that, yeah, it's like, why are there so many Dominicans in the U.S. military? It's like, well, let me introduce you to the history of the United States in the Caribbean and particularly in on the island of Hispaniola. And let's just go from there. I, I, yeah, it's, it's, you know, my, my wife's uh, naturalization has been filed in the UK. And so hopefully in a couple of months, we will be done with the home office, the British equivalent of USCIS. And it's, it's weird because I, I, I it's not the same here. I mean, I'm, we're, she's, she's an immigrant. I'm a guy who lucked into a British passport, but I understand maybe in a small level, the degree of what you're saying is that you feel as though it's very difficult to be frank about the criticisms of a system because, you know, the Brits will just be like, well, well it's better than America, isn't it? And it's like, It's not what I'm saying, though. What I'm saying is that you guys, you find ways to charge people tens of thousands of pounds for immigration fees so that they can't pay so that they're then deportable and you can deport them. You guys intentionally destroyed an archive of landing cards so that you could then deport, you know, people with British citizenship in their 70s and cancel their passports. Like, that's a problem. But it's like, as you know, the minute that you start talking, you're identified as not being from the country. And it's like, well, who, how, if, if, if basically, if you don't like it, why don't you go home kind of thing? And it's like, I feel so. The American version of that is different than the British version, but it it serves the same effect, which is just sort of like you said, create this eternal debt. This like you must be grateful and you shouldn't complain about. In this case, what you're describing with Mavni, a thing where people have been promised stuff and then just completely failed to deliver, and it's uprooted their lives. Another one we wanted to talk about before we closed out was you mentioned earlier the thousands of military veterans who have been deported. Who are were not American citizens, and then uh, the criminal justice system decided to force them out of the country. So I wanted to to give you a little bit of time to talk about your experience researching and speaking with people uh, who've experienced that. Yeah, I mean, super important to talk about it as part of the story. Um, so for various reasons, one that it's not as easy to get citizenship through the military as one would think, and um, two because. You know, not, not everyone can get their act together, even as a civilian, to go through this complicated process. You have people who are vulnerable to deportation. And so when people leave the military, um, you know, 
Sometimes they have struggles with finding housing, with substance use. There's all many, many different ways to come into contact with the criminal justice system as a veteran. And what happens, and what happened in a lot of the cases of deported veterans that I talked to, is you know when they were charged with stuff, they took the the guilty plea, mm-hmm. they pled guilty, um, which is you know ninety seven percent people do not go you know cases don't go to trial and like the TV shows that that sure, are constantly yeah. showing the trials. Um, and, you know, some of them did not know about any of the immigration consequences of doing so. So after they served the, um, the prison sentences, they were put in ICE detention. And some of them had, you know, fought for a few years and gave up. And, you know, there's there's variation in how long, you know, they were able to fight it out. But eventually they were just, you know, deposited uh, in the case of those who were born in Mexico on the Mexican side of the border or flown to you know, Jamaica, and there's deported veterans all over the world. Um, and they, um, especially at the time that I was doing these interviews a few years ago, you know, really had almost no access to any of their benefits. Yeah. And they, you know, disability payments, like nothing. And for the most part, these are people who grew up in the U.S. They often don't even really speak the language. They don't have a lot of ties anymore. Like there was one that had been adopted, <laughs> So him especially didn't have a lot of ties. Um, And that's, you know, not like a unique story. There's adopted people getting deported who are veterans is is another whole thing we can talk about. Um, And they they can come back to the United States to get buried in the military cemetery. Uh, You know, what's funny, not funny, but darkly funny, I guess, is that military veterans benefits, as I understand it, are not necessarily dependent on you being a U.S. citizen. So, for example, if you were classified as disabled by the VA, you would notionally be allowed to, you receive those regardless. But I know because I've just seen the paperwork that if, for example, you're incarcerated, it gets reported to the VA and they cut off your benefits. And my assumption is that in these people's cases that you, even if you try to get them reinstated, you couldn't, uh, or the VA wouldn't do it. And obviously, like it's very hard to go down and file a claim at your VA office if you can't enter the United States. So... <sighs> exactly. They qualify for these. But like they're they're couldn't even get evaluated for disability, right? Um, eventually, like, because of, like, huge amount of advocacy, including by the deported veterans themselves, they, like, had flown in a contractor from Spain to do the evaluations um, because they're not allowed to cross the Enter the United and, States, yeah. Yeah. Um, so just re- a lot of, like, really dire situations, um, you know, just, like, real struggle and I both talked to them like back in the day on Skype but I also went to um, Juarez in 2019 to meet some of the folks in person and to see like the community center that they had um, organized there to support each other yeah it's heavy stuff and I especially remember this one deported veteran who had been in prison for 10 years and his job in prison was sewing military uniforms yeah because you know there's there's laws about military stuff has to be made in the united states yep. well guess where it's getting made i i i i don't think that you can always point to one exact thing and say okay this is the thing that radicalized me politically but certainly one of the biggest ones for me if not the biggest i mean after the experience of being deployed and seeing the war in Afghanistan up close and just seeing the degree to which like, I think everybody understood anybody who was being honest understood that like the government we were supporting there was so unbelievably despotic and unrepresentative and that was putting people in an impossible situation. And that like none of the things that people said, we're going to turn the, turn the corner, turn the tide, win the war, we're going to work because at the end of the day we had installed a government that basically saw its job to do nothing but corruption and basically like political cronyism. So like just seeing all of the, the misery and the pain and like the suffering there and knowing that like none of it's actually going to accomplish anything. Like what happened in 2021 didn't surprise me. It surprised me maybe a little in terms of the rapidity, but it didn't surprise me at all in terms of the end result because of what I experienced in Afghanistan. So I was came back from, you know, 13 months in country and I was pretty down on all of it. And then I was back at my battalion headquarters uh, in the operations shop, and we had a, um, I, I think it was, I can't remember what the name of the, the, the sort of style of message is, but this is an urgent message. And it says, hey, like, 
you need to do inspections of all of your soldiers, all of their kit, uh, specifically their uh, what they call ACH, the Advanced Combat Helmet. Because the manufacturer, United Prison Industries, has confirmed that they have released, this was a bad lot that doesn't actually provide ballistic protection like it's supposed to. Now, these were all the helmets we'd worn in Afghanistan. And I thought to myself, I was like, wait, so you're saying that we were wearing helmets made by prisoners in America by a for-profit company paying these people slavery wages, and they didn't see fit to identify that they'd made a mistake and recall it before we went to combat with these helmets, assuming that they would at least in some way protect us. And that really, like, that was just this watershed moment. Like, what am I doing with my life? I mean, genuinely, it was, it was such, a, such a strange moment for me personally. And so thinking about what you just described, that like a guy who'd been in the military gets put in prison, is going to get deported, has no rights, has no recourse, and his job in prison is to make military uniforms. It's like, do you want to put a finer point on it? <laughs> like, can we put a finer point on it? Like, it's, it's so, so grim. Yeah, truly. Well, I don't want to end on the de- most down note possible. So I just wanted to say, Sophia, thank you so much for reaching out. This has been a really great conversation. I've really, really enjoyed this. And I wanted to give an opportunity to plug the book. So the book is, I'll read the title once more, Green Card Soldier Between Model Immigrant and Security Threat from MIT Press. I will link to MIT Press's uh, sales front in the show notes um, and uh, get a copy if this interests you, please. Because uh, I really, really found a lot in this book that either illuminated stuff from my own experience or made me realize like the the narrowness of my own experience and that there's just like so much that's changed, so much that, you know, and... And I think that even people who are military veterans who know some of some of this stuff, you know, some of the subject matter personally, I think there's stuff that will really kind of expand your perspective in here. So I, to our fans, to our listeners, I am saying you should buy this book. Um, and then I'll just hand it over to you, Sophia, if there's anything you wanted to, to end on. Well, thanks so much for reading the book, Nate. And your questions really made me think about things in a different way as much as I've been immersed in this subject. Um, so I really, really appreciate it. And once again, I want to reiterate that some of the things that um, I learned about the military as an outsider were from years of listening to your podcast. And as I was doing my research, so much was resonating. Um, and yeah, big fan. And thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And uh, for listeners, uh, we'll be back next week. I believe Francis is going to have something on deck. I am about to be out on paternity leave, so I may disappear for a while, but uh, I will be back eventually, I promise. And so, uh, Sophia, thank you again, and we'll we'll speak to you soon. Zoom, zoom.